Thanks uh, all the organizer for the invitation, and uh, it is an honor to be part of the conference to celebrate 85th birth, uh, birthday of PolyU. So I uh, changed actually my title slightly uh, to reflect the uh, conference theme, which is about wearable. So um, I call it now actually a uh, high temperature PPE. PPE usually stands for uh, personal protection equipment. So it certainly is part of wearables. And before I start, I do want to actually share uh, a very clear message that actually uh, printed plastic electronics is real. So we have been talking about plastic electronics for decades. And often, you know, people would ask, where are those, you know, plastic electronics? Here I show you, um, you know, where it is. So what actually you see on the left is actually low to row coating of uh, electrochromic polymer and the speed of, uh, you know, 30 meter per minute. On the right, actually you will see uh, the electrochromic sunroof on an electrical vehicle. And uh, so this actually was made from the plastic thin film made from the low to low coating. So if you actually want to have such a sunroof, actually you can choose one of the models from these car makers. And if you don't want to afford a car and you can still play with electronics, you probably can buy a cell phone. And actually that Oppo actually uh, work with MB Light develop actually electronic phones. So my point is that actually plastic electronic is real and it's coming to our life. So what I'm going to talk about today is another interest we have uh, in my research group and uh, which actually started actually uh, four or five years ago. So so-called actually high temperature uh, electronics. So what does actually refer to high temperature electronics is kind of device that actually can operate at 150 degree and higher. So if you think about our cell phone, our laptop, all the electronic we have, usually they have the temperature, you know, along actually 85 Celsius degree. Beyond 85 Celsius degree, your electronic is going to fail and it's going to malfunction. So, well, so this actually is, we started this program uh, long, late 2007 and uh, early 2008. We have already completed actually the uh, phase one study on uh, how to achieve high temperature organic semiconductors. Right now we are pursuing high temperature organic conductors. So where, but where this program coming from, right, is cannot come from nowhere. So, and this actually coming from our earlier studies and from actually 2005 to 2018, my research group was pursuing to actually liquidifying organic semiconductor. In other words, actually it's to make a semiconducting polymer melt processable. So at the time, uh, you know, when we talk about actually organic, like organic semiconductors and organic electronics, we are often emphasize that they can be solution processed. So at the time we were, we were asking the question, could they actually they be melt processed? Because in industry, that's actually one of the way that you know, you, you're you using to make plastics. So over actually past, you know, from 2005 to 2018, and we have come up with strategy to make semiconducting polymer melt processable by introducing the so-called by introducing the so-called actually, um, by introducing these so-called complementary semiconducting uh, blends. And what we actually essentially did was introducing a flexible spacer along the conjugated polymer. So that actually the melting transition temperature could be approached. And based on actually different, si different side chains, different spaces, you can actually milk them process from over, you know, a long, as, as, as low as 100 Celsius degree. And we have demonstrated actually, you can use this blend for melt processing. And the, you know, transistor device could be just as good as those processed from solution. And sometimes actually even better. And actually we further demonstrate actually, you can make semiconducting fibers and directly actually from, you know, this melt polymers and you can chew the semiconducting fibers directly, continuously upon doping and this actually semiconducting fiber will become conducting. 
As you see from this figure on the least semiconductive fiber, certainly is flexible and uh, to a certain degree, they are stretchable as well. So this side actually we make, you know, uh, on, on this side, actually we make a uh, melt process polymer. But on another side, we're also very interested in how actually this polymer behave at a different temperature. In the past, you know, most of us in the community study the charge transport mechanism by investigating low temperature regime. Since we are actually using melt process to uh, deal with this polymer, we like to know how this polymer will behave at high temperature. And it is surprising, not surprising to find out actually this polymer at the high temperature, you know, the performance will degrade. So that actually is where the story started for high temperature electronics, high temperature semiconductors. We want to actually address this red zone. Is that possibility actually to make these materials that can actually operate it at 150 degree and higher. So looking into literature, actually it is not surprising actually, you know, using temperature to do good things. And for instance, you know, the community has used thermal annealing to improve materials properties. What actually thermal annealing will do to organic semiconductor using this small molecule as example is that actually thermal annealing would actually change the packing, change the morphology. In, you know, in some cases, it will improve performance. In other cases, actually will, you know, get actually design, undesigned morphology change, it will actually ruin the device. So people have studied thermal annealing of semiconductors exclusively. Now, relatively speaking, that there are much less study when it comes to, you know, the device operation under thermal stress. And here are two examples we could find at the time, actually let's study how these materials, these semiconducting mo molecules and the polymers behave under high temperature. What you would be able to find here is that for these particular molecules, you know, from room, room temperature under to 200 degrees, and actually they can switch stably between uh, room, temperature and, uh, room temperature and two Celsius degree. Um, of course, actually, you would see this charge carry mobility increase then job with the temperature drops. Well, on the other hand, actually, for this, this small molecules, because they have two polymorphs, and they actually respond differently to uh, thermal stress. But nonetheless, actually, for, from all the studies in literature, it seems that, you know, organic semiconductor cannot really give you stable performance at elevated temperature. So in 2019, uh, late actually 2018 and the early 2019, and actually we uh, published this paper, and we first demonstrated actually that you would be able to get semiconductors and the semiconducting po uh, polymers that actually can perform in reliably at the elevated temperature. So what we essentially have done is actually pol make polymer blends as you have seen uh, here. So what actually is our result? As you can see from this figure, this would be regular semiconducting polymers like this DPP and one of widely studied polymer. As the temperature increase, you charge permeability increase, then the performance starts to degrade. Well, for actually our polymer blends, they can actually be stable from room temperature up to 220 Celsius degree. So what did we do and what we, how actually we come up with this design concept? So it is well understood actually in the community that charge carry uh, transport in organic semiconductor, you know, is proceed with a hoping mechanism. If you increase the temperature and likely you're going to have increased charge carry mobility. Now it is less understood, but you know, can be understood, it is less studied, but it could be understood is that actually once the temperature hits certain range that you are going to have actually morphology evolution to the point actually that you destroy the desired uh, same film morphology that lead to actually the pool you know, stability of charge transport. So the question is, 
how could we stabilize in the morphological chains of semiconductors at the elevated temperatures? Of course, that you know we can design new molecules and new polymers to achieve this, but we actually think differently. We thought, you know, could we simply using a blend strategy, you know, using a high glass transition temperature as uh, insulating polymer to confine the semiconducting polymers, considering that in the community, you know, there are very larger library of high TG insula insulating polymers available. There are also actually a very larger library of semiconducting polymer available. If this approach works, then we actually open a door to access, you know, a wide range of uh, high temperature semiconductors. So, with that in mind, actually, we start our investigation. We certainly choose, you know, the polymer we have studied, the DPP-based tersiphene polymer. And for the insulating polymer, we choose the actually polyvinyl uh, copper zone, and which is also widely studied as a high band gap or insulator polymer for OLS. So when actually we mix these two polymers in solution with different weight ratio, and then you make actually cast the same film and due to the phase segregation and you will actually get actually different, uh, uh, different morphology. And then, you know, as high as 90% PVK as low as 40% PVK. Yeah, actually you will be able to interesting at uh, uh, the right range, you will be able to form these kind of interpenetrating networks. So how does it work? And as you have seen, you, when you make actually the blends, uh, some optimized ratio, for instance, actually 40 to 60, 40% uh, semiconducting polymer and 60% um, insulating polymer. And you would be able to achieve, you know, as I showed you earlier, this is in air, very stable charge carry, uh, very stable charge transport performance from room temperature up to 220 degree. Similarly, actually under nitrogen. So what actually make this happening, if you actually look at the blends. Now, actually you would notice actually that this is a pure polymer and this are the blends. So it seems like you're due to phase segregation and uh, actually make the semiconducting pack more tightly and uh, more orderly. And this can also be tell comparing with this pure polymer and the blend. This in you know, the polymer blends are red shifted. It's also an indication of a higher ordering and the packing. Now, if you actually subtract these same films for heating from room temperature all above to 220 degree, you would be able to see for the pure polymer, you know, this peak, low energy peak actually disappear quickly. Well, for the actually 60% PVK, you will see actually this peak, you know, remains even at 220 degree. In other words, actually that this PVK can, can indeed hold the semiconducting polymer and able to achieve thermally stable micromorphologies. So this actually is more uh, direct evidence. And if you actually see a P, uh, P1 and a PVK blend and you know, no heating and after heating, you barely see any morphological change. And for the pure polymer, you will see a kneeling effect. And for the pure PVK, because it's amorphous, you don't see much. So then we want to figure out, you know, what are the key parameters would actually influence such interaction? And we actually look into a wide range of, you know, insulators, uh, commercial, a lot of commercial available from, for instance, you know, PAC, PMMA, uh, polycarbonate, uh, polyimide. And not surprisingly, some, Polymer blends work, some don't. Uh, for instance, this actually, this is the um, pink line, is P1 PMMA, and actually it fails. Well, for other, you know, polyimide base, actually they holds pretty uh, so firmly across the temperature. So, you know, why actually the P1 PMMA would not work? And he actually, you know, shows you direct evidence. You know, for P1 PMMA blends, if you hit up the you know, same film up, up to actually 120 degree, because that's actually very close to the TG of PMMA, the whole thing just becomes softening 
and the matrix polymer were not able to hold, you know, the blends together. So in other words, you know, glass transition of matrix polymer certainly it is important. And uh, of course, actually, there are many more uh, parameters will play a role here. For instance, you know, we found with these two polymer, and actually, if you move the branch chain from the conjugated polymer backbone, actually will improve the thermal stability. And also, actually, the molecular weight will play a role because that you know will influence how the polymer and the matrix will mix to get actually interpenetrating network. Of course, actually, you know, the insulator chemical structure will also play a role. And you know, even further, actually, that the device structure would play a role as well. You know, so if we put it is actually, you know, we are relatively confident to see over the past, you know, four years, we have figured out most of the design, design parameters actually to achieve high temperature uh, organic semiconductors. So, and we actually take, not take advantage of what we have learned to make actually all plastic high temperature organic transistors. So what you have here is that your substrate is a polyimide, and your dielectric is another polyimide, and your semiconducting layer is a po another polyimide. You know, in blend with a conjugated polymer, and all pro you know all this is processed from solution, except actually this source string gold electrode, which is you know vapor deposit. And actually, if you test the device, and you will be able to see that actually. You know, you can you will be able to see the um the the the, uh, the current actually just increase slightly, and of course actually the off current also increase slightly, but the uh, threshold voltage holds pretty steadily. You know, within one volt. Most actually impressively, actually if you put this device on on a top of a hot plate, and then you actually heat up the device, and measure their performance in situ. You know, over the course of actually two hours, showing two hours here, actually we have data for 24 hours. If you actually see this transfer curve and output curve, they overlap very nicely. In other words, actually this device can operate it very reliably at high as 195 Celsius degrees. So I use actually, uh, you know, code here because as I mentioned earlier, this actually is not truly all plastic device because we are still using actually gold electrode. So if we are able to replace the gold electrode with a printed organic semiconductor, then we probably would be able to make all plastic high temperature organic transistors and eventually to make high temperature PPEs. So let's actually get into the second part that how we actually design high temperature organic conductors. So if you think about actually semiconducting polymers because it's a crucial structure and you don't have free charge care available, so the actually conductivity is very low. How do you improve the conductivity? You dope them. So the doping usually involve a dopant. Either if you have P-type doping, you have strong oxidizer. If you have N-type doping, you have strong, strong actually are reductant. Now, there's a problem with that. First, if you have strong oxygen reductant, and the dopants themselves are not actually very stable in ambient. Second, and after actually they give away or receive one electron, you actually have actually state a aromatic structure become actually red N9 or red chitin. Then this you know counter N9 becomes unstable. For instance, F4 is F4, F4 T7Q is you know frequently used as a molecular dopant. And F4C is actually very reactive. You if you actually put the lemon in air and in air actually they will be oxidized. Also, actually, when the F4CNQ take one electron, they become radical N9. This radical N9 becomes extremely unstable, can react with a lot of chemicals. So this is one problem to achieve actually stable and efficient doping. Another problem actually with doping actually is that it's very difficult to process them. Once doping occurs, and this becomes actually uh, the, the, the solubility of the semiconducting polymer 
changes drastically and when it becomes actually conducting polymer. And it's a very difficult process and pattern. So in our study, actually, we come up with you know, a, a design. And let's actually, you know, a deviation from conventional thought is that actually we introduce this so-called aromatic ionic dopants. Here, you actually we separate the doping and the charge compensation into two different components. So here you have a troponium chitin as a chitin. Here you have actually a rheumatic enzyme penta cyanopentadiene as a uh, acceptor, uh, as actually a counter enzyme. So this actually, to make them is relatively straightforward. You start with you know, sodium cyanide, react with you know, uh, carbon disulfide. You would be able to get the list um, um, six membrane through desulfonization. You get actually tetracyano uh, sulfine, and then through another desulfonation, you actually get a list uh, sodium PCCP through ion exchange. You can get actually a bunch of aromatic uh, uh, aromatic ionic dopants. So, because actually these these dopants are ionic, and actually you can through actually a sequential processing. And you can actually first lay down a layer of dopant, then you coat the polymer. Because they are immiscible, they're not doped until you actually you heat them up, then they become doped. So we actually studied a bunch of them. And in the case of HCCP, without heating, they're already doped because proton is very small to diffuse inside the same film. Well, actually PBA, PCCP, because you don't actually have the doping, doping part, so they are not doped this same film. And we will look actually into TPCCP uh, very closely. And as you would be able to see, if you actually don't heat up the same film at the room temperature, this polymer is not doped. As you increase the temperature, and then actually the, you know, the neutral peak will disappear, then the poron, biporon will rise, indicate, indicating actually you're doping the same film by controlling actually the you know, thermal annealing temperature and the, the time, you would be able to actually um, get you know, very different doping levels. So upon actually, after actually we get actually dope thin film, then we study actually whether this thin film is thermally stable. So if you actually look at the list P, PCCP system, and we actually, change the temperature between 40 Celsius degree and to 150 degree, you can see up and down, up and down, very close to each other, but you know, almost actually a, a, a for this, you know, cycling test, they are very stable at, you know, uh, up to 150 degree. And this, if you heat up this in air for a week, and they can retain the conductivity over 85%. In other words, actually, it's fair to say that you know this system is thermally stable. So we also actually look into how this doping occurs. Now, as you would imagine, actually, this doping actually itself is crystalline, and the polymer is amorphous. And well, actually, when you heat it up, they become actually homogeneous thin film, which can also tell from this XPS. Uh, this actually cyan nitrogen from a cyanide group with this peak upon doping actually shift to actually um, a lower e bending energy. So this actually is what we think what's happening here. When you actually first make the same film, you have bilayer and because of the immiscibility, once the doping occurs, then the polymer will be doped, become charged. More dopant would be able to diffuse into the same film eventually will lead to bulk doping. And uh, we actually look into uh, the doping mechanism. The first thing we actually want to figure out whether this actually is an electron transfer uh, reaction. Unfortunately, and uh, you know, this actually is the energy level of our polymer, and this is a dopant. And it seems that actually the electron transfer is not preferred. You cannot directly dump electron into this piece of uh, troponium mo uh, molecule to form a radical, which is just not favored. And we also actually have indirect evidence. If you look at these two polymers, they have very actually similar homo level. 
uh, this polymer could be doped. Well, P3HT cannot be developed. In other words, actually, this is not determined by the energy level. So eventually, actually, right now we, you know, we are uh, leaning towards this. Actually, is an electrophilic reaction, and actually form this intermediate. Then through interchange charge transfer, you generate actually this radical chitin, and actually this polymer is dope. And uh, um, of course, actually, we need further evidence to establish that. So what we have done is actually taking a uh, small molecules. And we actually we make these small molecules, you know, uh, put the list open, small molecules together. And, uh, you know, and we're very satisfied we will be able to observe this actually product from a mass. And actually, as showing here, in other words, electrophilic reaction is feasible in this reaction. Another thing actually we notice actually is that upon actually this mixing, you would be able to see the rise of this peak and actually just a single peak. Usually, if it's red chitin, you will actually be able to see two, uh, two uh, peaks. Well, here you only have one. Let's like also suggest this would be actually um, a chitin intermediate to do actually electrophilic reaction. Now, last, as I mentioned earlier, for doping, processing is difficult and the patterning is even more difficult. Now, in our case, because this actually is a thermal, thermally activated doping, and we actually can use a laser direct to write the pattern uh, by hitting you know, the specific area you want to. So you can control the laser wavelengths, you can control the laser intensity, you can also control uh, the, uh, the laser writing duration time. And you actually would be able to generate actually the pattern as you wish. As you would be able to see, you know, for this part, which is undoped, has very low conductivity, which be, is nearly a neutral polymer. Well, actually, for the dope region, you can get in you know, 100 Siemens per centimeter, which actually is five orders, five orders making the difference uh, between dope region and undoped region. So for the high temperature part, we have demonstrated actually, you know, we are able to achieve actually thermally stable doping. And we have demonstrated actually this could be orthogonal process through sequential process. And we are also be able to pattern our organic conductors. So right now, uh, we are still actually trying to figure out the rest of, you know, to make the high temperature organic cement conductors more reliable. And right now it's at 150 degree, and we certainly you know want to make it higher. Uh, also, actually, right now the conductivity is about actually 100 uh, 100 Siemens per centimeter. Certainly, we want actually conductivity higher. So, but nonetheless, uh, to do our phase one study and the phase two study, we are confident to say that actually that you know we are one step closer to make the high temperature uh, printed plus electronics, and of course it will take you know much longer to fully develop, you know, high temperature uh, printed plus electronics. So, and uh, I, you know, these are the people uh, who have performed studies and, you know, including your former graduate student and uh, uh, postdocs. And I think that my time is just, yeah, 10, 10 30. Thank you uh, for you uh, listening, yeah. And any questions, welcome. Oh, hi, hi, Jianguo, nice to meet you. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to give the talk. It's a very nice talk. Uh, well, I have two questions. Uh, one is about uh, uh, glass transition temperature. So here yes. you only consider the glass transition temperature polymer, the insulating polymer. How, how about the semiconductor material? Um, that's a very good question. And uh, um, I have actually another probably, I can actually deliver another probably 30 minutes talk on that topic. So. Uh -huh. Over the past two years, actually, we have worked with actually uh, Professor Xiaodang Gu at the uh, South Mississippi University. And um, the glass transition temperature of semiconducting polymer actually plays a very important role. And in certain cases, and you actually do not need a high glass transition temperature of insulating polymers if you are able to push the glass transition temperature of semiconducting polymers higher. 
And uh, so for semiconducting polymers, and uh, actually there are two glass tension temperatures. One is so-called actually amorphous, uh, amorphous uh, glass tension temperature, amorphous fraction. And the other actually is called the rigid amorphous. So for most of our semiconducting polymers, and uh, we were surprised to find actually the rigid glass transition temperature is along 130 and 140. We have actually studied you know, uh, dozens of polymers, and a lot of polymers actually have glass transition temperature along this region. And actually that most of the time we find uh, that actually they will start to fail along this region. Okay, so, yeah, that's great, yeah. thanks. So uh, well, uh, another question is about uh, uh, conductivity of your uh, dopped polymer. So mm -hmm. if you compare it with uh, P dot PSS, it's uh, commonly used the conductive polymer. Is it mm -hmm. uh, better in the thermal stability if we change the temperature? Uh, actually, we didn't measure the conductivity of P dot PSS as a function of temperature. We don't know whether it is uh, your, your, your polymer is better. Uh, actually, I have a, I have a slide on that topic, and I deleted that. Actually, I have a slide on actually P dot PSS. So if you using pristine P dot PSS and they are rather temperature stable, however, if you actually treat your P dot PSS with DMSO, which is very frequently used by many uh, researchers to improve the condu uh, conductivity, then the same film becomes extremely temperature sensitive. And you will be able to see the conductive jobs as you increase the temperature. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Professor May, we do have a number of questions uh, online. The first one why did you particularly target more than 150 degrees C, not more than 160 uh, or 200 degrees C? So, uh, well, the definition of high temperature electronics is not some we came up with and actually is there's actually community in inorganic semiconductor and they consider and if you have a device that can operate beyond 150 degrees considered high temperature electronics so that's often we choose 150 degree or 200 degrees Celsius degrees all right thank you uh, another question is uh, when Okay, uh, yeah, when the semi-conductive uh, uh, polymers are mixed with the insulator at a high temperature, will the conductivities of the composite uh, decrease due to the incorporation of the insulators? And then so, how to balance it? So uh, for this part, actually, that in the polymer blends part, we mainly uh, focus on the charge carrying mobility uh, which actually is a you know, uh, transistor performance to describe uh, charge transport. And there actually the charge carrier mobility would not necessarily actually drop. Actually in certain cases, because uh, due to actually phase segregation and actually the polymer would actually, in certain cases, even pack better and they can give you higher charge carrier mobility. And this has been proven by uh, many, uh, including us as well, so. All right, thank you. The last question. Uh, through doping, uh, we can improve the stability, yet uh, how can we fight the uh, brittleness uh, at the low temperature? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. Um, that you know, Sometimes that you cannot use, um, you know, uh, there's no uh, silver bullet. Actually, you can address all the issues. And here, we are particularly interested in high temperature uh, applications. So we are not actually considered uh, them for a low temperature. So. But certainly, you know, if this is one of the criteria, uh, we can certainly address that. So we have not addressed this issue. So.